Hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of Aussie Tech Ed. This is episode 628. My goodness, don't they start creeping up. It's uh, getting to be quite a big number. Uh, it's the 11th of April, 2019. Easter is upon us next week. Uh, I think we've got, I don't know, we might not have a show next week. I don't know, we'll have to talk to the boys uh, and see what we're doing, because next Thursday night will be, uh, I suppose, Good Friday Eve. I don't know. People might want to go out and have a life, so we'll see what happens next week. Uh, I'm your host, Glenn Goodman. Welcome again to the show. Uh, we are brought to you by Aussie Tech Heads, uh, athwebhosting.com.au, and that's... Uh, Oh, that's uh, good stuff, good hosting. <laughs> I've started to read, and the, the, someone's moved the paragraph around. But anyway, it's uh, servers are operating on SSD drives, immediate activation, SSL certificates, Aussie support, uh, domain registration, all that sort of stuff. So you can go in, you know, you can uh, think of a domain name, try it, see if it's available, and if it is, away you go. Uh, we're also brought to you by startnewcompany.com.au. Register your company fast, easy, and direct with ASIC, get all the documentation, all the certificates and everything you need to walk out the door and start trading. ABN as well, You can so you get the ACN, the ABN, uh, and I think they've also put up a huge amount of other documents that you may, may be interested in, like partnership agreements and all that sort of stuff. So you can have a look there, download those. And uh, yeah, away you go, startnewcompany.com.au. Now, if you want to call us tonight uh, during the show, you can. It's 02-8015-2088. So 02-8015-2088. And the meeting room number is, you need to take this down, is 548-358-6358. I might ask Joe if he can pop that into the chat room, please. Uh, it's in the show notes there, Joe, if you can't remember that number. Uh, yeah, so you can do that and uh, just leave your, just comment if you're going to ring in, just comment with the last two digits of your phone number so we know who you are and we'll, uh, yeah, just hang on and we'll get you in. All right, uh, don't forget the AussieTechRadio.com. You get, so it's wall to wall, back to back podcast, Australian pod tech podcasts, uh, tune in radio app or uh, just or on the web. It's uh, go to that website, AussieTechRadio.com and you'll find out how to listen to it. Uh, bit light on this week actually with the with the episodes and podcasts there's been a few podcasts that haven't produced in the last week so um yeah but uh we're here don't you fear also like us on facebook.com forward slash aussie tech heads and youtube.com forward slash aussie tech heads if you want to tell us something or get us to our opinions on something why not send it into the facebook or uh or youtube it or twitter it or whatever uh, all right, what else have we got cooking here? That's about it. We might as well get uh, get Joe on. How you going, Joe? I'm good, thanks, Glenn. How are you? Good, thank you. How was your week? Yeah, it was pretty good, thanks. Excellent, excellent. Uh, getting cooler in Sydney, I think? It certainly is. I can start to feel the weather now. We've taken a time back an hour. That's right, so, yes. Um, so it's starting to get a bit cool. And we've got the number up there on our Facebook page now if anyone wants to call us. All right, good stuff. So uh, just make sure, just hang on. We'll just because, uh, like, like, unlike like, like last week, just hang on a little bit longer, and we will just try and get you in when there's a bit of a break in the conversation. I can't do everything at once. Okay, so I'm a I'm a guy, you know. Isn't that way how it goes? Uh, yeah. So yeah, I was talking to someone in Sydney today, and they said you know, I had the jumper on and everything. I'm up here, just it's still warm. It's uh, look, I've got a little fan in here. It tells me it's 28 in here at the moment, so that's still pretty warm. But uh, but yeah, got a few public holidays coming up. Um, we've got the Easter, then we've got the Anzac Day, then a, then Queensland's got a May Day. So um, I don't think much work gets done in Queensland around this time of year. But uh, anyway, that's that's good. <laughs> that's good. All right. Uh, well, might as well just move on and get straight into some stories. I've got a few this week, a couple that uh, sort of uh, jumped out at me. So uh, we'll, we'll get through those. But probably my first one this week is uh, Google. Australia has made history. Google drone delivery service takes off in Canberra. So apparently this is the first the, the first Google drone delivery in the world, apparently. So Google's drone service made its first air delivery in North Canberra earlier this week after getting approval from the Civil Aviation Authority. Now, a limited set of eligible homes in the suburbs of Crace, Palmerston and Franklin and would gradually expand to customers in Harrison and Gungarlan. So if you're out in those areas, you can be, expect to see a few little Google drones flying over. It looks like a, if you can see that picture on the, if you're watching the video, it looks like a fairly big drone, doesn't it? It's got a big, it's got a camera underneath it or something. Yeah, it looks pretty big. Uh, Google said 
Wing, it's what it's called. It's uh, called Wing. Wing has been testing drone delivery in Australia since 2014. Over the past 18 months, Wing has delivered food, small household items, and over-the-counter Camus products more than 3,000 times to the homes in Fernley Park, Royala, and Bonithan communities, Google said. So there you go. That's all happening down in Canberra. Uh, that sounds pretty interesting. I mean, I wonder how how that's going to go. I mean, you reckon we'll have some issues with that? Yeah, look, I don't know. I'm not probably a fan. Like, I don't want drones flying over me. You know, like, if you're going to sit, get the, the Google drone, then you've got the Amazon drone, you've got the Australia Post drone, you've got Domino's drone, you know. Well, the sky's just, you're just going to be buzzing all the time. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Joe. I don't know. I, don't, I, I, know, I can see it's a, uh, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a good, easy way to get deliveries happening. Um, I'm always worried about them just running flat, falling out of the sky, hitting on the head. Um, yeah, I don't know. I wonder. They probably don't just take the route of the the roadway, so they just be flying directly, crow flying over the over your house. So, look, maybe they're high enough you don't hear them. Maybe that's what what it is. Yeah, I was going to say because you know when is the cutoff point for the uh, for the deliveries? Like if you've got something at seven o'clock or eight o'clock or nine o'clock or ten o'clock at night, and you hear these things buzzing around there. They're going to be a lot louder. Yeah, oh, that's right. I'd say there'd be some sort of uh, there's some sort of rules, and uh, yeah, but I don't know what they are. But I'm sure there will be. Otherwise, people wouldn't be happy. But yeah, look, I don't know. We've had we had a couple of drones flying around here out the back of our place, and I think they were like real estate drones. You know, just taking films of uh, or, or pictures of the house that was for sale just down the street. And yeah, you, well, we could hear it quite clearly. I suppose had to get in and low to get the picture. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe one, maybe one drone, but maybe not the whole the whole gamut of them. Uh, or maybe yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Like anything, we just got to see how it goes. But uh, but I think Amazon was saying that uh, what they want to be able to do is they they just want to say you put your order in in the morning, like I don't know for a I don't know a DVD, and bang in about three hours or less it can be at your front door. So it's pretty good in that respect. Yeah, but we'll see what happens. All right, uh, we've got a comment. Chris in the chat room says, "All governed by CASA." Yes, that is right. But what are CASA's rules? That is the question. Uh, so there must be. Well, all the aircraft have uh, little time restrictions, don't they? Like you know, you can't fly planes into airports past uh, ten o'clock or whatever it is, whatever airport you're at. But yeah, but uh, but yes. All right. Uh, what have you been up to, Joe? What did you find this week that you thought was interesting? Um, I'm not a gamer, but but PlayStation apparently is um, allowing the users now to change their username on their PSN network. Right. Yes. Because uh, I think so. What they didn't do that before. So obviously not. They, they you couldn't no, do they it. No, they weren't allowing you to do that before. But um, apparently, it's uh, something they'll be able to do directly on the PS4. Um, or on a web browser. Um, apparently, there's a, um, a catch to it, though. It's really easy to do, but there's a bit of a catch to it. Um, the first name change you have there is for free, and any other changes after that, uh, $9.99, right. to have the name changed on the PSN network. Uh, Sony's saying that if you're a PlayStation Plus subscriber, it's only $4.99 for um, each change after that. I wonder why, like, like, why do they charge to change the name? Like, it's not as if it's a manual exercise that someone has to sit there and, you know, and type this change in. So I wonder why it's uh, why it's like that. Because I know with the Xbox, because my kids have got the Xbox uh, One, and you can change your name, I think, the same, like, once for free, and then it's $10 for each additional one. But um, I don't know, maybe it gets confusing with, a thousand name changes if everyone did it a thousand times don't know but uh... yeah look I, I don't know um sony says that um once you've changed your your name your old username it still belongs to you um and uh, it's it's you can always roll back if oh. you don't like the name that you're having right you can always roll back for free okay um, yeah so when this changing there's an option to display your prior prior name as well for a period of about 30 days. Right. So that you and the person that you're uh, playing with on the PlayStation Network um, does know that you have a different name and they know who that was before. 
fair enough. So, so is that like an? Un, did you say it was unlimited rollback? Like back through? Yeah, the, you can uh, you can un- you can roll back any time you like. Yeah, right. So essentially, then I guess for whatever reason, essentially you must be like when you pay your ten dollars, you must essentially you're buying that name, so no one else can use it. Maybe, maybe that's the case. But there's also mm. another reason for it. Um, apparently. Sony has a, a list of uh, games that either have um, experienced uh, no issues or some games that have got issues uh, and some games that have got critical, critical issues. Um, there's a link in the show notes with, with that. Um, it's a good idea to check it before you do anything because um, if the game does have issues, um, it could be that um, it's not popping up the right name. Mm. Um, it could also be that if... Um, if you're having issues with uh, your, your saved data and stuff like that and leaderboard status. Oh, yeah. 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 If you're having issues with that, sometimes they don't carry on to um, to the new name. So you might want to also check that list of um, available games because if you have access to downloadable content that you've already paid for, you may also lose that as well. Mm. Yeah. So it's a good idea to... Um, to have a look at that. Now, apparently they said that games that are released on or after April the 1st in 2018 shouldn't have any of these issues. Right. Now, that's not an April Fool's joke either. That's <laughs> the date that they've, uh, they've said that you shouldn't have any issues if you bought a game that's uh, released on or after the 1st of 2000, uh, 2018. Uh, you shouldn't have any issues. Now, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm no gamer. I mean, I don't play PlayStation games or anything like that. But if I was somebody that was playing PlayStation games and was really wanted to change their name, I'd actually go check out the link um, that we have there in the show notes um, and think twice before changing the name. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just, just to have a look through the list of games that... Um, that uh, accepting with um, the name change and also if you have got a list of games there as well that that tell you whether or not you know you're going to experience some sort of issue with it and so perhaps you might want to hold out um, changing your name on that yeah so, um, yeah yeah I know because my kids oh, I think you just get when you sign up you get some just random generated tag name tag and yeah they don't care oh, who, who really cares like there's so many uh people in the world or so many people playing the xbox that you know you, you're not going to get joe and glenn you know as your game tag so you're going to end up with you know glenn 226 abc xyz or something like that and then once you start getting like that well who cares no one's going to know who you are anyway so um yeah but uh but yeah cool good stuff so uh so play, Sony PlayStation, welcome to the the real world. <laughs> okay, uh, look, here's, here's a uh, here's a little story I picked out. As we all know, the election was called today uh, on Thursday, uh, so I got a little election story. So the Labor Labor's NBN policy calls for the rewiring of seven hundred and fifty thousand homes. Now, two reasons why I picked this out is because, A, it was MBN, so it had something to do with what we're talking about. Uh, but I'll read the story and I'll tell you the second reason. So the ALP has launched a new national broadband network policy with the headline item being a pledge to rewire 750,000 homes using fire to the node. Now, from what I can get, it, we're not. it's not talking about uh, rewiring from the node to the house. It's talking about rewiring the house, as far as I can see, because they're saying that a lot of people have old wiring in the house and that's probably and that contributes to most of the problems uh when they're on the fiber to the node so the plan uh the the plan will improve speed and reliability for those homes the policy calls the mbn co to do the rewiring at no cost to the household so maybe there's three things that uh got my attention with that so no cost to the household so mbn pays so therefore we pay, I guess, as taxpayers. The the this will reduce dropouts and improve speeds for broadband services up to seventy five. So that's good, great for those guys. Uh, but then the other thing that made me laugh was as when the NBN was first uh, put out there, you know, on the back of a coaster in a plane or something, as the story goes. Uh, this policy now announcement was not accompanied by costings either 
for the domestic rewiring or other elements of the plan. So it's a uh, hairy fairy, I reckon. But just just funny how it's uh it's not this even this part ten years later that coming out with just uncosted stuff. I, I don't I don't get it. I think we've spent enough on the NBN, haven't we? Fifty one billion or something. But, um, yeah, it was it was way it's lucky it's gone double the budget it's it was allocated, wasn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's and, gone. And yeah. they're still talking about um limiting bandwidth as well. Yeah, so look, it's not good, but look, I guess it's it's be good if you're in a household that does need the rewiring, and yeah, 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 you can't begrudge that. Like seriously, I don't, I don't begrudge that. Yeah, if you need it, you need it. Uh, yeah, does it say whereabouts uh, the rewiring takes place? Would would that be to the the first socket of the house? I well, no, well, I think. Um, well, they're talking about the rewiring of the actual house, from what I got out of the policy. Uh, out of the story let me have a look on the let me get that story up and we'll have a bit of a peek uh, because you, normally normally the nbn gets wired to the side of the house and they put your box there and yes. then from there you're meant to plug into the first socket of your house um now uh, i i get it i mean you know if, if if the wiring up to the first socket of your house is not good that they can probably fix that up but um otherwise I mean, sure. In why not just go there and and get the whole house rewired if they allow you to? I'd say I'd say it'd have to be reasonable to suggest that it's to the first point, and then if you've got other points in the house, well, then maybe either you pay for them yourself or they just disconnect them so that you've got a nice clean uh, connection to the first point. Um, I can't see anything in this story here. No, this will reduce so reduce the dropouts. Uh, the pot was not blah 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 blah, blah. long term casual blah, blah blah. Yeah, so I can't see it, Joe, off the off the top here. That's all right. It's just just something to think about because you you get the NBN installed, and um, then after that you have all these extra fees on there, and you say, oh, but that was supposed to be free, so it's a good idea to get it all checked out beforehand, though. Yeah, Facebook is telling me it's only to the first point, so you're right. Yeah, even Ray in the in the uh, the Facebook feed is also saying it's probably going to go to the first point on there as well. Yeah, yeah, but I know because that's the that's where they've got most of the problems, isn't it? The this fibre to the node, then copper into the house. Like I know a I know a guy that I've been working with, and he's just just drops out all the time. And you know, he, Optus is pretty much that they, they just ditch you after a while. They've got no interest in helping you, and so what you're just left with a house that drops out all the time, and it's just very frustrating. You don't know what to do. You just just don't know what to do. But uh, I told him he just he'll have to get the phone dude out and just just yeah check the re, check the wiring up into the first yeah, point. Yeah, I guess once he's once he's had the phone dude out to check the wiring up to the first point, if it's still okay there and he's still experiencing problems, you might want to get a your own electrician out and get him to check the rest of the wiring in the house. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, all right. So uh, we'll leave MBN there. I'm still haven't got it yet. Uh, it's available, but not I haven't got it. I'm looking at this fetch box. I think we did this last week, so I won't do it again. So, um, yeah. So, what else have we got, Joe? What what else took your attention this week? Well, you know how Microsoft is um, urging to the, um, the Google Chromium Edge uh, browser now. Yes. Well, apparently, it's released a, a a preview version of the Chromium Edge browser. Right. Uh, early adopters say that it's noticed that it's very stable and it's performing surprisingly well. Did you say a premium version? Is that what you said? Yeah, a preview version. Oh, preview, right, sorry. So it hasn't been released to the masses yet. Right. But there is a, um, a preview version that some people can download, right? Some developers and some people that um, need to know about it, like some website administrators and uh, network administrators that need to know about this sort of thing. Because mm. yeah, okay. apparently it performs very, very, very good in... Um, in the uh, Windows 10 environment, despite being built by uh, Chromium, an open source project, they reckon that it works really good. Right. Yeah, so the uh, the company says that it's removed some of Google services um, in order for it to be um, working on, on with, with Windows 10. Right. They've either replaced them or removed them um, to optimize its performance. Now, Spell you can see tech. some people who are watching on the screen can actually see some of the services we have up there in the wall. Um, the one that I jumps. haven't had a chance to look at it personally, but apparently Microsoft has removed uh, or replaced more than 50 
of Google's own services that come past that come part of Chromium. And this includes things like ad blocking, Google Now, Google Cloud Messaging, um, and Chrome OS related type stuff. I can see one of them that that, that uh, caught my eye spell check. So I'm sure that Edge has got, probably got their own spell check. But yeah, oh, cut, that's right. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah. Push notifications, Google Now, domain reliability monitoring, feedback. <laughs> yes, yeah, I suppose you'd have to remove the feedback, wouldn't you? Otherwise, all the all the complaints would go back to Google. Uh, yeah. So there's a few there. Over fifty, you, you said. Yeah, there's over fifty different services that they've decided to either remove or um, redo. Um, so, it, so it suits their Windows 10 environment. Hmm. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. So I know, look, Chrome has been, I mean, uh, look, Edge is okay. I've been using it more and more. I've been finding, I'm having a few little issues with uh, with Chrome of late, uh, but I still have to go back to it because I think that it's ex- the extensions that, you, that I've got with the Chrome just make the browser work how I want it to work. Uh, you know, if I, if I want something in Drive, I've set Drive up as a search engine like in the back end of Chrome. So if I'm, say, I'm looking for my show notes like each week for when I do the show and they're on the Google Drive, in the search bar, I just type in Drive and then space show notes and it just goes straight to it because it knows when I type in Drive, that's the search engine I want to use because uh, I've set it up that way. So it's really, it's good how you can do these type of things and uh, uh, yeah, and, and just customize it to the way you want to do it. It's, it's not too bad. But, but then again, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, negatives as well. <laughs> like with anything i suppose but yeah are you a big uh, edge user joe uh I, I do use chrome yeah i use it for everything that i have yeah yeah so look i don't know i haven't opened up ie for a while i might have to take that off my task bar i'm just looking I, I at don't it even now. think you can get ie anymore i think it'll be um the um the edge browser now isn't it so that's what they're basically doing you'll probably find that there'll be an update coming soon um, where they'll, once they've got it all working right, they'll introduce this new Chromium or Edge type um, browser into Windows 10. Mm. Uh, and then slowly, slowly they'll start introducing services because, you know, they had to sort of merged with um, with Google, you know, so you can get, the, you know, from your from your smartphone to your, to your Windows 10 uh, interface and things like that. So you slowly, slowly they'll start building their own little things. For it, yeah. Well, I guess like IE, I don't, yeah, because I I know I've got it here. Maybe I don't know if it comes now with the with the standard Windows ten install. But I know from a when Windows ten started, you would load up Windows ten, you wouldn't see it on the taskbar, but you could always search for it. It was still there, and you could then put it on the taskbar. So I'm not sure if they've taken that out now or not in the in the latest builds. Uh, but I don't know. I think there's a lot of lot of legacy type sites that probably still need to need ie um i don't know what they'd be <laughs> but uh but some sites like so i think is it sites like the tax office and that i think i use edge because other browsers just can't handle it um although i think that the tax office likes chrome now these days yeah chrome sort of took over didn't it i think was it last week we said the chrome's got about a 70 percent market share which is huge yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know what? And if Microsoft, you know, used this Edge browser um, on a Chromium, you know, in, uh, version, you'll find that um, they'll probably introduce, like I said, a lot of um, services from from Google in there as well, plus some of their own as well. Yeah. Um, well, I think Google and Microsoft appear to be getting tighter and tighter, don't they, in different yeah. areas? Yeah, it um, looks that way. Yeah, so uh, was it? Well, was... You know, they've even gone back now to developing versions that will run on Windows 8, uh, Windows 7, and Mac OS as well. So, right, yeah, and then they've also introducing some um, support for ARM, right. ARM processors, along yeah. with some enhancements like um, something to do with PDF documents. They're supposed to be doing something for you know, battery improvements, yeah, okay, smoother scroll. Um, it's giving you options to edit and lay out different type of features of um, settings and different options for layout of, your, of the browser. They're what, going to introduce what are the development f- tools and um, web authentication. So uh, this is all part of, um, I think, for smartphone or tablets and something that's not actually a PC environment. 
Mm. Yeah, because I look, talking about the chrome and, and stuff, like one of the things that annoys me a little bit is say, like, you know, so what, say when I do the show notes, right? So it's more than one page. Or when you try and copy like multiple pages, you know, like just left click and select, like, do you find that it just, it's just a really slow scroll? If you've got everything selected and you're trying to select more, more, more down below, it just sort of goes doink, doink, like this. I can't get it. Yeah, a, yeah. It's on it, every it does browser. do that with me as well. That's because it's all got to go back to the cloud, back to the servers back to find it. Well, back into its memory or, or something, I know. But it's just, oh, I don't know. But even, oh, I don't know. But even if it's, uh, say, in the back end of WordPress, which is probably not on the, because the page downloads into the, you know, downloads, from the cloud to edit it but even just to select uh, the whole page uh it just don't don't and you know you sort of wiggle your mouse down the bottom of the screen makes it go a bit faster and stuff do you, do you yeah. get that yeah I, I, I do get that yes i do get that what i normally do is i normally use the scroll of the of the mouse and just click it a bit at a time and that helps Okay, radio. I might try that because it annoys me to no end. Thinking this has been the this has been like this for years. Like, why can't you just select multiple like scrolls just like that? Why not? <laughs> why not? But, <clears throat> but talking about Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has paused the Windows 10 upgrade and advises admins to prepare for a May release. So apparently there used there should have been an April 2019 update pushed but they've delayed it to uh, may 2019 so once this release lands microsoft has again uh yeah said that uh, they're gonna they're just gonna they're gonna they'll let you they're, they're gonna let you be able to pause the update uh, uh for i think seven times let me get this let me go to the story uh they're gonna windows 10 has gone yeah, because normally what's been happening is Windows 10 just updates itself. Everyone's been getting the irrits with that because, you know, you'd be sitting there doing some work and just go, pop, updating. Or, you know, you let it go overnight or something and it's still updating the next morning when you come in. Uh, so it's making it possible for all users to pause both feature and monthly updates for up to 35 days. So seven days at a time, up to five times. So once the 35-day period is reached, users will need to update the device before pausing again. Um Yes, so that's the story with that update. Because I think, remember they copped a lot of heat with the, is it 1809 update when that came out because of the, uh, everyone installed or whatever and everyone lost all their photos. There was a big bug in it. That's um, right, yeah. I remember speaking a couple of weeks ago about something similar. Mm. Um, when Microsoft decided that um, they would themselves will, del- will install some sort of a, an update on the phone and if it does some sort of diagnostics with the software and with your hardware, and if it finds that it's going to cause a problem, then it just doesn't install the update and it holds, it's sending you updates until the actual updates uh, are being uh, fixed up on their end. That's right. <laughs> I don't know what the answer. I think we did. We had a. Well, I think we had a bit of a big conversation about this. I. Don't, I can't see. Like, do they not do enough testing? Is there not enough uh, uh, preview people out there, or Windows Insider people out there? Is there just not enough? Uh, but uh, look, you know, I, I don't think they can cater for every scenario. I mean, they can probably cater for the most scenarios, but there might be something out there that they can't sort of cater for. They might miss something. So. Mm. Look, I guess, I don't know how many windows are installed around the world, but I, I guess it must be, uh, it'd have to be a billion at least, wouldn't it? At least. So it'd be, uh, it'd have to be. So it'd be quite a few and there'd be quite a different, quite a few scenarios, different tweaks, different uh, settings on different people's computers, languages and, and time zones and whatnot. So look, I, I get it. But, uh, but something like destroying data, which is going to be pretty much widespread, <laughs> That was a big no no. They should have they that shouldn't have happened. No way. All right. Uh so that's the Microsoft one. And what else you been doing, Joe? What else you found? Well you know how Google's got this um little USB type thing that you plug into your laptop or your computer and it's yes. like an authentication key? Yes. Well apparently now um you can use your Android phone to replace that sort of thing um, for two-factor authentication. Oh, yeah, uh, nice. Yeah, Google has announced that it's uh, Cloud Next Conference, that it has developed a Bluetooth-based protocol that will be able to talk to its Chrome bra- browser 
and provide a standards-based second factor for its access to its services, similar to what modern security keys do right now. Yeah, so is that only to access the Chrome? Access must... services on your Chrome browser, yes. Right. Normally, second factor comes to you in the form of a push notification or yes. a text message or or some sort of authentic, authentic, um, author, authentication app like a Google Authenticator or there's another one. What's that other one that's that very popular authy? as well? That's or, it? Yep. So rather than using those sort of methods where the, the risk is that somebody can intercept uh, those numbers or some sort of phishing account can be accessed, um, and then quickly um, log in, in uh, your second factor before you actually get it. Mm. Uh, rather than doing that, um, it's it's decided to do its own one. Yeah, well, look, I guess that that's okay because it was a little while ago I tried the you know that that set. There's a setting in Windows where you can keep your computer locked, and as soon as you walk away, it as soon as you walk away it locks and that was because of a bluetooth setting to your phone so it knew when you were out of the out of the area would just lock itself but i could never get that to work i don't know if there was something wrong with the bluetooth chip in the in the board i don't know but uh but this is not bad because there's a few times you log into things and you know into chrome or into like a, a service that requires your chrome password or whatever then you log in as google and then you get oh, authenticate on your phone and you go well where's my phone i've left it upstairs or something you know and you just gotta go find it you gotta just push yes but uh but look it's all secure i've i've come to uh, realize you do you probably should have two-factor authentication on a lot on most things that you do um there's a lot of people getting hacked out there there's a lot of people yeah that's uh, right but yeah so so that looked all right so was this a dongle did you say joe or this, or this is the actual phone now this yeah, is this fun. is the actual phone. Um, mm. so it's, a, it's a new feature that will work on all Android uh, 7 Plus devices Go that on. have Bluetooth and have location uh, services turned on. Now, um, Google's own Pixel 3 phones um, include what uh, Google says is called the Titan M tamper-resistant security chip in it. Right, geez. Right? So that actually gets extra protection. But the company is mostly positioning this as a bonus and not so much a necessity. So it's just an extra thing that you can have. Yeah, well, to, that's... Uh, to secure your two center uh, authentication there, mm. two step authentication. Because you know, I like I uh, like to use LastPass as the la the password manager. Well, I thought yeah. you know I probably because I got into a bit of a role uh, this week. Uh, summer, I was talking to someone about two-factor authentication. I thought, you know what, I probably should uh, just do it on the last pass as well. But then it didn't have it didn't have uh, two two FA for Authy. I couldn't use Authy with it, and I thought, well, that's no good, is it? So, like, I would have I would have thought Authy was just pretty much you know just standard type of um, two-factor authentication app. But yeah, it didn't have it. So uh, I, I did read that I could. I think Authy was compatible with the Google Authenticator. So I have to look into it, but. It makes me scared now because I don't want to be locked out of all my passwords. I'll be screwed. Yeah, I haven't used I haven't used Authy for a long time now. I've just been using the Google one. That's been working pretty good. I think I tried the Google when I first did it, and the thing I didn't like about it was I couldn't back it up. So, like, if I lost the phone or something happened, then I, I, I don't know. What do you do when you lose your two-factor authentication stuff? Like, what happens then? Are you just stuffed? I don't know. I don't know. Good, good question, that. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I chose. I, that's why I went to the Authy because I can back up the data into the Google Cloud, I think, into the drive, and um, maybe that's not as safe as whatever. But it's got to be safer than not having it. So, yeah, but have a look into that, Joe, because maybe you can't back it up. So, what happens if your phone gets stolen uh, or something? Yeah, it, it, it goes on to say here. As far as the setup goes, the whole process isn't all that different from setting up the normal security key. Um, and you still want to have a second or a third uh, key handy just in case you do lose or your original um, or do you lose or get your phone gets destroyed somehow. Mm. You'll be able to use this new feature for, bo for both work and for private Google accounts. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, yeah, yeah, time has come where you've got to up your security these days. Uh, if you use something like LastPass, I know for a little while now I've just been every site you log into, you just generate a password, save it in the LastPass, and away you go. It's good. Uh, yeah. All right. Just one last thing with that is that they're also talking to um, 
Microsoft Edge and, Mark, and Firefox browsers. There's also talking to support them as well in the future. Well, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah, why not? The, the make it easy. Easier the better. And, uh, yeah, I think the phones are a pretty easy way to do it, aren't they? Everyone's got a phone. I don't think of many places on the planet that don't have phones, in the Western world at least, anyway. That's uh, right. Pretty much pretty much with you all the time, anyway. Yeah, or, or it's not far away. Uh, it's always charged. It's always, yeah. Well, like, like you were saying, that you don't have to have it next to you. I mean, this is all done by Bluetooth, so therefore you don't even have to touch your phone. Once it receives the authentication, it, it authenticates via Bluetooth, I'm, I'm understanding. Mm. And it just goes ahead and authenticates without having to do anything. That's yeah. what I think. It's, that's what I think it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's what you. I think you're right. Yeah, because it just it'll it just senses that it's uh that's in or it sends a little ping out to the phone. It goes, oh yeah, there's the phone. So this guy's here. So let's hope he's not uh yeah not dead and uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> All right, uh, Melbourne. Remember there was an Apple store going up or well, trying to be built in Melbourne in Federation Square, and there's a bit of a hoo ha about it. People jumping up and down. Uh, saying they don't want to build, going to wreck the skyline, all this sort of stuff. Well, anyway, the day has come that the decision had to be made whether or not the Apple Store was going in, uh, and it is not going in. So the, I don't know, the the uh, the againsters uh, have won. So Apple hopes to ho- to build their global flagship store, or a global flagship store in Federation Square, but, when it, but it had to demolish this building called the Yarra Building, uh, because it said that it couldn't accommodate, I don't know, it couldn't accommodate its hoped-for store and other facilities that it only installs in super-sized flagship stores. So Melbourne residents didn't like the plan, lobbied pretty hard, and obviously hard, a, a lot hard, because they won. Uh, anti-store activists relied on the fact that the Yarra building, the building can't be touched without sign-off from Heritage Victoria. So Heritage Victoria rejected the plans uh, to do it and uh, said it would result in an unacceptable and irreversible detrimental, a lot of adjectives there, impact on the cultural heritage significance of Federation Square. Uh, So there's a document that goes on to say that Apple's proposed building was too big, out of character with the rest of the square, and eats into the public space. So they added that, uh, that the likely economic benefits of the store don't outweigh the damage done to Federation Square. I think it's just a picture. Did I have a picture of Federation Square, the building? It's ugly. <laughs> so, I don't know if I would have cared if that got knocked off. It's uh, yeah, it's not uh, ugly. But I don't know. Uh, I guess at the end of the day, you know, what can Apple not find a, another location? I guess they're going to have to. But you know, if this is like a is. You know, it's a heritage building. Did they really have to have that location? Why that location? Uh, they're just going to have to move on, aren't they? Tough titties, I guess, end of the day. Um, all right. Did you have any more, Joe? I don't have any more at the moment. But um, I, but if you have another one, go ahead, because I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the smart switches and smart light globes. All right, well, I'll, uh, I'll do another one here, and then we'll get on to those. Uh, oh, yes, this one here. This is uh, this is a warning. Illegally downloaded Game of Thrones episodes expose you to viruses that hijack your computer. So hackers are disguising viruses, surprise, surprise, as illegal download ahead of the show's hotly anticipated final season, uh, which apparently starts airing this week. So Kaspersky Labs said that cyber criminals often use popular TV shows to spread viruses and apparently Game of Thrones is their weapon of choice. A whopping 17% of all infected pirated content in 2018 was disguised as Game of Thrones download and apparently 21,000 users attacked. Uh, the number is especially uh, high when you consider the show did not release any new episodes last year. And more than 126,000 users downloaded malware instead of TV shows in 2018. Well, I would have thought it would have thought it'd be more than 126,000. I don't know where these sort of stats came from, but uh, it just serves as a warning anyway, or as you know, make sure you know what you're doing if you're going to do that sort of stuff, and uh, or if not, um, can't you just get Netflix? Only 10 bucks a month. Is it on Netflix or Stan or one of those, or is it is it uh, exclusive to Foxtel again? They say you got to subscribe to Foxtel. But there, there was something I saw through the week. No, today it was, that YouTube TV. Have you ever heard of YouTube TV? Yeah, I was looking at that today. Apparently, it's got around about 
uh, 50 or 60 uh, channels that you can get? Or no, is that 50 or 60 dollars a month and you get around about 200 channels? Yes, it's, uh, it's not cheap. Uh, it's probably just like the Foxtel, but I, only, I got an email. I, I wasn't even too sure if this was just available in the US or not, but oh, I don't know, the email came to me, and I'm set up as Australia, so whatever. Uh, but it says, uh, yeah, cable-free live TV. Uh, you can try it for free for a month, forty nine ninety nine a month. But one of the most in, uh, interesting aspects of this was that it's uh, you have uh, unlimited or free PVR access so once you sign up to it you can record so to speak any show that you want unlimited so uh and then play it back later so isn't that's that- right and, and i think it, it records it back into the cloud somehow yeah and even if you're not home and you're on holidays or you're somewhere else and you want to watch it you can actually log in from there and watch it yeah so no storage limits because because that's the thing see this is the thing when i'm changing over to mbn probably gonna have to ditch the foxtel box and like do I really want to get rid of a PVR? Like, I record stuff, you know, like for, I record free to air TV so I don't have to watch the ads. Um, I record, if I, have to, if I have to watch something, I record it. Um, but yeah, so that was, that's a big, that, that was a thing. So you can have six accounts per household on this YouTube TV. Uh, free DVDR or free DVR storage space, three simultaneous streams. Oh, there you go, enter your five digit zip code. Here we go. It is probably US. I don't know why they send me the messages. I put me, I put my postcode in and invalid. There you go. But look at all the channels though. Uh, BBC, BBC America, Bravo, um, CW, Food, ESPN, HGTV. It's all there, isn't it? Fox News. It's all there. Cheddar. Is that Cheddar News? And Cheddar Business. ABC. That's American ABC. Yeah, there's a there's a few there. True TV, TNT, TLC. But so maybe uh, this might come to Australia one day. But anyway, because it doesn't look like it is here, I think we're pretty much determined it's not going to be here because it didn't take my postcode. So we'll get off that and we'll move on to something else. Um, Joe, what are we talking about? Well, I was just going to say this week I was spending a bit of time looking at automating my lighting at home. And... Mm. Um, I'm sort of stuck between do I get Wi-Fi light bulbs, do I get Zigbee light bulbs, do I get uh, Z-Wave light bulbs, do I, you know, do I go um, via Smart Things Hub, do I go through mm. Philips Hue? Anyway, there's a whole heap of questions that arose from me looking into this, and um, I, I really don't know which one's the best way to go. I mean, I've le- I've led to the conclusion that they're saying that you're better off using a smart switch which is and just leave your normal incandescent globes in the ceiling um, or your normal LED globes in the ceilings yes now I had a I had I've got some feedback about that I was, yeah, talk, I was talking to a guy that uh, wanted to do that and so he had to put had to put something or, or wire something in behind the switch or something uh, but to do that he had to run a I think he was in an older building, an older unit, and uh, he had to run a negative or something from the light socket, but he couldn't run the negative because he was in a unit and he couldn't get into the roof to run the lead, to run the cable. So that could be a little negative if you wanted to go down that track. Does that sound right? I think I got that story right. Yeah, that's right. Some houses do require that that uh, active, uh, an, especially an active three, three poles, basically. You've got your, your, your earth and two active um uh, run into the switch uh, so some of them require that third one and uh, a lot of them don't have that in, in some of the houses that they build today yeah so and if you can't access the the conduit or whatever up in the ceiling well you might have to rely on the wi-fi but why do they reckon do it that way is it more stable that way or what why why go down that path well the reason they're, they're saying that to go through the smart switches path rather than going through the smart globe path is that with smart switches, you still have access to be able to turn the switch on and off should the Wi-Fi go on, um, off, oh, or yeah. whether you have some issue with internet access. Right. Yeah, fair enough. So if, um, if you've got the bulb, uh, say so you can't, if just the Wi-Fi bulb, are you saying that doesn't, you can't turn that off and on with the switch? Well, you know? no, if, if, if your internet goes down, yeah. right, the bulb goes, it gets controlled uh, via the, the Wi-Fi. Yep. So and the Wi-Fi normally talks to a, some mess, some service in the cloud, and then comes back to you. 
Yes. But but you could, like, if it was on, say it was on, and the Wi-Fi <clears throat> dropped out for whatever reason, you could go to the switch and turn it off. Uh, no. more. Yeah, you can go off and turn it off, but I think to turn it back on, you, because it only right. works via the Wi-Fi. Yeah, okay, yes. Right, yes. there's no physical cables going to it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so turn it, yeah, I can get that. I can get turning it on is going to be probably the, the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what, what I've been looking at this week is a, a product by um, Lutron, L-U-T-R-O-N, and they have smart switches um, that activate on uh, two wires, I believe, rather than the third wire. Right. And it's all built in together. And, um, and this is just a, a wiring behind the switch, or you can remove the other switch and put this new switch in. And... Um, you can use this with your normal incandescent globes, your normal um, LED globes. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, radio. So, um, I think we just got a message in the in the chat room there from Andrew saying that he's got one at home, and you can flick the switch off and on. Uh, if the Wi-Fi is out, you can switch it off and on, but you just can't dim it, etc., and change colours, I guess. So, but going back to that, like if you were to go the switch thing how hard is it is it a diy job to put this thing in behind the switch or you got to get a sparky out is it something that you should do yourself or something you should look if you're, if you're handy with with um you know doing stuff like that you know by all means you know if you know what you're doing you can do it it's not something that's really too hard it's just a couple of wires you've got to obviously take turn the power off in the home hmm. and it does come with instructions right um, you, you turn the, the power off and you wire up the back of the switch. Um, where it becomes really, you know, interesting and, and becomes a bit funny with is when you have, you know, two or three way switching, because you, you, if you don't know what you're doing there, you should really call an electrician in to get it all wired up for you. Right. And what's the difference in price? Do you know, Joe, between the, the switch way and uh, the Wi-Fi bulb way? Well, going by the Wi-Fi bulb, if you've got four or five, let's let's talk about downlights for a moment, right? If you've got mm. four or five downlights and you want to go Wi-Fi uh, in a room, that's four or five downlights you've got to buy that are Wi-Fi enabled, um, compared to just one Wi-Fi switch. Yeah, yep. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you buy one switch for the whole room, and in that room you can buy better, you know, four, six, eight bulbs, whatever it is. Mm. So um, that's that's you know, that's one of the advantages, which is cost as well. What's the switch worth? You know, well, look, I, I don't know. American dollars. I haven't gone that far into it yet, but apparently American dollars is about uh, fifty or sixty you know, US dollars for a switch. Right. Okay. Um, so and bit... you, can, you can get the dimmable ones as well. That ones that allow you to dim dim the the lights as well. Right. But so so. Do you have so wouldn't that but isn't that controlled by Wi Fi though? Or is that you have to get the dimmer in the switch that you install as well? That's right. Right. Yeah, so you get one with the dimmer with it and one without. Yeah, okay, right. Uh yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a lot to it, isn't there? Yeah, so and that also then has um a bit of a um like its own little hub, very much similar to a um you know, the the Philips Hue hub or the Smart Things hub. Yeah. <clears throat> and then that all controls the Wi-Fi that way. So that way, uh, you can control the, the the dimming of that that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I might look into it one day. I've got. I've just got old school lights, <laughs> down lights, but old school. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, you finished with that one, Joe? Or you got more to say? Yeah. No. That's that's it. I'm just 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 sort of like saying that you know, I'm I'm looking at going down the smart switches route rather than the globes um, for that reason. Yeah, I think that's probably, I guess, yeah, if you've got, a, if you've got your, like, say, your kitchen, and you've got five lights in there on the one switch, yeah, do the switch. But if you've just got a, a little bedroom, you can probably just do a globe and have fancy colours yeah. as well. Yeah, and all these things, obviously, they all work with uh, Alexa and Google and stuff like that. I mean, the globes, I, I've been looking into the globes. The globes are more for, like, a little lamp at the side, of the, of the lounge or behind a chair or the desk or something like that. Or if you want to turn a fan on and off or mm. – uh, sorry, not a fan. If you want to turn the fan light on and off, you just put a globe in there as well. I guess the next thing you've got to think about with all this Wi-Fi in your home is you've got to make sure that the Wi-Fi – there's no black spots. 
you know, around the house. Well, that, that, that's the other thing as well. You look into. Um, I don't know how how crucial it is, but you know, you put five or six globes in each room, and you you get into the point where you've got about thirty or forty globes in your house. Mm. That's got to do something to your Wi-Fi signal. You know, it's got to eat it up some bit. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's, I suppose everything's on its own. Like IP, it's on the same frequency, but uh, but I suppose maybe the signal. I'm not sure exactly how Wi-Fi works, but maybe it just goes out uh, and it just talks to each device until it gets the right one. It says, "Oh, you're number three, okay." And number three goes, "You, here I am." Yeah, um, but each each I think each one of them is always on, listening to you know, the Wi-Fi be. signal. Yeah. Well, so but- you know, it it'll. I've read that. It, it, it has a tendency to slow down your network a little bit. Oh, so like deplete the signal, do you think? Like, it, Yeah, so, you know, it's like, you know, you've got, you know. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, so you, yeah, you got, yeah. So you've got a standard, you've got a, you've got a couple of computers, yeah, you've got, you know, a couple of Google Homes, you've got an Alexa's in there, and you've got, you know, maybe two or three globes. That, that That's okay. But once you start getting 30 or 40 globes, um, then you start getting the, um, you know, sensors like, window sensors and door sensors and yeah. uh, cameras. Yeah. It really starts to load up your Wi-Fi. Yeah. Well, um, it, so you really need to then get a, a, a heavy-duty uh, Wi-Fi router, and that costs yeah. hundreds. And I'm talking about the 300 or $400, just a router. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you, yeah. you need to get something that's like a, a dual core or you know, they've even got yeah. quad core routers now. <laughs> I know. Gigahertz and everything. Like, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it really gets it really gets involved. Yeah, and that, that yeah, and, and no doubt the the router modem router that you get from your ISP won't be able to probably handle a, a real big installation. Oh no, definitely they won't be able to handle it. No, mm. but move, let's move on to uh, McDonald's because they're asking customers to show ID when they purchase via credit card. <laughs> so, in a bid to reduce the weight of fraud. Uh, uh, by scammers, uh, apparently obtaining free burgers using dodgy, dodgy payment cards, uh, McDonald's is randomly asking for ID for people who are paying with credit cards. So that's a bit random, isn't it? <laughs> so the company has started putting up signs warning diners they could be randomly selected. I've got a sign here that was up in the it's at St. Leonard's store. So, uh, yeah. So apparently uh, people... Uh, yeah, they can go in there and purchase small amounts, like for food, small amount of money, tap and go or whatever, and that's fraudulent. I don't know how McDonald's loses out at the end of the day with that, because I thought if the bank accepts that the accepts the payment and shoots it through, well, you know, McDonald's doesn't lose out. But but apparently uh, this goes on and says that it can happen, it, that it can be uh, in it can be McDonald's problem because they've accepted. A, a lower threshold. And so because they've accepted a lower threshold before uh, PIN numbers or whatever, that then, yeah, so they, they assume some of the risk. But a decade ago, McDonald's was also in a scam and it was the main, it was a scam that was for about $4 million, uh, was busted by the Western Australian police. It was a fraud ring. Uh, which what that did was they swapped out McDonald's payment terminals and replaced them with their their own. That's a bit ballsy, isn't it? And uh, so then went their own terminals, the, the scammers' own terminals. Uh, when people swipe the cards and everything through, uh, re- retained all the data and got all the the details, to, so the scammers could go and use them again. So some merchants opt opt for a trade off. Yeah, that's it. this is this is what I was talking about before. Yeah, some merchants opt to, opt for a trade off of faster transaction processing times that skipped individual authorizations below a certain dollar, uh, f- because fast food is essentially not resaleable, unlike you know like booze or whatever. Uh, the yeah, so the, it was downgraded in terms of risk fraud or fraud risk. So it's widely known that is a very low. What is what is widely known is that very low card transactions are sometimes used by card carders to validate. That doesn't make sense. But anyway, so what they're saying is, some what what's what happens is the people that steal a card, they'll go in and they'll get a very low transaction purchase. And they go, okay, this card works, and then they'll they'll go and, and do another one and a bigger one somewhere else. But yeah, so. It's, yeah, that was a bit of a mess, wasn't it? That story. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's what's happening. But anyway, that's pretty. Ended- that's pretty, that's hmm. pretty smart thinking. Yeah, but end of day, uh, yeah, McDonald's is getting hit by some fraud, and so they're asking you for ID just to make sure everything's kosher with you. Yeah, and uh, look, to, to 
to end the show on. I've got another one here. There's a Hong Kong data cable is going to be built. And I've got a picture of where that's going. There we go, from Australia all the way to Hong Kong. So the Singapore-based H2 cable company uh, is to supply and install a data circuit spanning Sydney to Hong Kong and onwards to the United States. Now, on the Sydney to Hong Kong leg, this H2 cable will have a capacity of 15 terabits per second uh, per fibre pair with an onwards connection to China. The Hong Kong to US link will have 12.9 terabits per second per fibre pair with a single end feeding capability of more than 13,000 kilometres. Yeah, it's massive, isn't it? You start thinking about these things. The cable have branching units so that spurs can be added to reach Taiwan, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Guam, Queensland, woo, and Hawaii. Now, the H2 cable will land at Coogee Beach in Sydney, and it will also be near the LAX airport in Los Angeles, and a landing site in Hong Kong is yet to be confirmed. So I think, you know, I think things are moving that, you know, as we come ever closer to Asia, the Australasian region, uh, things need to get a bit faster. So I'm not upset about that at all. I've got a couple of servers over in Singapore. So, you know, they'll uh, hopefully get faster, get quicker access to them. So that'll be good. Uh, but it must be a big job to lay these cables. It must be a massive job. I think it was something, it was, uh, I did see a price when I was reading that. It was something like $300 million to do it, to do this job. So just... Just massive, massive. So the cable, I don't know, this is just random without notice, Joe, but uh, the, the cables, they can't lay on the sea of the ocean, can they? It's too deep. No, they don't, no, they don't always lay on the bottom of the ocean. Um, where they can lay on the bottom of the ocean, they do, but they don't always lay on the bottom of the ocean. You're right. Mm, yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, pretty much going to finish our show off this week. We've got a, a Facebook chat from Brett. He goes, hey, guys. You spoke last week about the Ubiquiti Unify Wi-Fi bearer last week. I installed the TPCP 510, 5 gigahertz units at my property and send my internet to my neighbours. We are both on acres. That's very good. Let me see more. Oh, my God. He's put What's he put here? He's got everything. Oh, my God. He wrote a novel, Brett. <laughs> So he's okay. So he's got on my neighbours. We are both on five acres. He has not missed a beat in four years, and you can buy two units for one hundred and fifty dollars. Couldn't recommend them any more highly. They are you, there are YouTube videos of them working up to twenty seven kilometres line of sight. Yeah, they're very good units. I've seen them in action as well. They're very good, very very good. So if you've got some internet problems or you need to get some access, and like even uh, you can you can shoot this stuff across town. If you have to line of sight, you know you can have a you can have a wacky do connection over in uh, in the, in your house and buy a couple of these little fellas and send it over to your mate's place. I don't know five kilometres away and, and share the bill. Easy, <laughs> good stuff. Nice work. Yeah, thanks for that, Brent. That's very very good. Thanks. Uh, all right, so that'll uh, bring us to the end, Joe. Unless you've got anything else to bring up. No, and that's it for me this week. Yeah, good stuff. It's a bit later for me this week because the daylight saving ends. It's uh, normally I start the show at five thirty. I have to start at six thirty tonight. Oh, no wonder I'm a bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's good that the daylight savings ended. Like being so close to the border, you know, I don't get confused. But it's um, you know, like you, you say, oh, I might ring such and such or whatever, and you go, oh, he's an hour later. He might be you know out or in bed or or whatever and so you sort of have to think twice about doing things and yeah just sometimes it just just put you off kilter a bit but it's all good now that we're back on the same time so yeah good stuff all right joe good work thanks for all that thanks for coming no in and uh hopefully uh yeah have a good week and we'll, we'll let everyone know what's happening next week whether we're going to do a show on the anzac uh the good friday eve or not so we'll see what happens. I hope you got your footy tips in. Oh, the footy tips, yeah. I'll get, I'll get, catch most of the game now. That's another good advantage of being on the same time zone. Yeah, good stuff. All right, thanks, Joe. We'll see you again next week, and thanks everyone for looking at us at uh, on the Facebook. Thanks, Brett, Ray, and Chris, and Andrew. It's like it's like romper room. Scott, <laughs> the. Yeah, and Josh, and everyone else that's logged into the Facebook. I can't keep scrolling. But anyway, thanks. We'll see you next week. All right, well, maybe. All right, cheers. See you guys. No, see you guys. Thanks very much.